A bit of background, my mother and I didn't really get along while she was alive. Without going into too much detail she was a very difficult person to be around to say the least. We had a bunch of fights but two years before she passed she cut me out of her life completely. I still tried to keep up with her, asking the family members that did talk to her if she was still okay and how she was doing, because, despite our inability to get along, I still loved her. She went on to pass away in October of 2020, and I had conflicting feelings about it naturally. Especially since our relationship was severely strained. I have a lot of regrets about that. Especially the fact that when she died, no one told me she was even sick and in the hospital until a nurse called me to tell me, her only next of kin, that she had passed. So she died alone, as the rest of the family couldn't be bothered to even see her, apparently. Fast forward to the birth of my first son, a month ago roughly. Now, I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to ghosts and things like that. I truly don't believe it. And I mean I still don't. But this I can't really explain, I was getting the shot to numb the lower half of my body for a c-section. I was terrified. Not from the pain of the needle but for the whole situation entirely. I've never had something like this and I was so scared. For some reason, the first time I've ever done anything like this, as I was crying I kept saying in my head, be with me mom, please be with me, as they put the needle in my back and the numbing started to work. Right after they started to move my body into position to start cutting, I heard her voice in the back of my head say, I'm right here baby, and I could have sworn I felt her presence in the room with me up until they were able to get my fiancé, the father of my child, into the room with me finally. Then I no longer felt her. The whole incident lasted no longer than three or four minutes. Like I said, I'm a skeptic. I still don't believe in ghosts. Like, I took care of all my mom's affairs after her passing by myself. I even have her ashes in an urn that I plan on spreading in one of her favorite spots one day. For the past nearly two years since her passing I've not felt one thing. Not a presence, not a word. Other than dreams I'd have on occasion about her, there has been complete radio silence on her end if ghosts slash spirits slash etc. Dio exist. But this I don't exactly have an explanation for. I know it's not an interesting story, not much happened. But this is the only thing that's really stuck out to me. This happened two nights ago. My friend who is an 18-year-old female and I, 18-year-old female too, were on our first trips without parents to Paris. We are from Ireland so it wasn't a big deal. The beginning of the trip went off without a hitch except for your typical creepy old men. We dressed up pretty nice going out to the clubs, so it was to be expected. On the last night of our trip we headed out to the same club where we had met another girl who I will call Mary, who is an 18-year-old female. Unfortunately, there was a list and we couldn't get in this time. So we walked around the streets at 1 am trying to get into more clubs but were denied again. At this point we were ready to head back to Mary's apartment, until we bumped into a guy around our age named Stefiano. He told us he knew a good spot and asked if it was okay if he practiced his English with us. He seemed pretty nice so we let him walk with us. On the way another man wearing a bucket hat approached us and immediately I smelt weed off of him. I turned to my friend and she shook her head, not liking his vibe. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. He began trying to convince us to get in his small silver Peugeot parked across the street since the club was a 20-minute walk. We obviously said no, having watched Taken. So we walked on. However, a few minutes later he quickly pulls up to us at a red light and starts offering us drugs if we get in the car. We persistently said no until he sped off. After being left alone for 15 minutes, we arrived at the club. We got denied again since my friend and Mary forgot their IDs. At this point I was very annoyed and my feet were killing me from the heels I was wearing so I suggested we go home while we stood outside the bollards beside the club. All of a sudden the man appeared again, trying to convince us to drive with him to another club. We were kind of freaked out since we didn't know how he kept following us so well. 
I was extremely unnerved and politely told him we weren't interested. After unanimously agreeing to go home, we head to the nearest bus stop to wait for our Ubers to arrive. The man pulled up again, this time more frantic and swung his door open, urging us to go inside for drugs and partying. I was extremely annoyed at this point and sternly told him, you aren't welcome here, leave us alone, trying to keep my language clean to not provoke him. He eventually left in a huff. We were left flabbergasted, unsure of what had just happened. Soon Stefiano and Mary parted ways with my friend and I, leaving the two of us to wait for the Uber back to our hotel. Shortly after, a group of Iranian women and an extremely inebriated British girl approached the bus stop. I talked to one woman, asking her if the girl needed any more help. She politely declined and explained something concerning. The British girl's friend had left her alone that drunk at 3 a.m., and the Iranian girl had just pulled her out of the door of some strange man's car. I explained what had happened to my friend and I earlier, and asked the model of the car. A small silver Peugeot. She also added the area is renowned for sex trafficking of drunk girls outside of this particular club. Eventually our Uber pulled up and we headed back to the hotel. As soon as we arrived inside of the hotel, my Nazar eye bracelet I've had for over a year snapped. I'm not very spiritual, but my nanny has always had me superstitious about the Nazar eye. I'm not sure if the same man tried to take that poor British girl, but I am certain we were in danger that night. This is a true story about British folklore. There will be no skinwalkers, no Wendigo, or anything of that ilk. But I think my pagan ancestors had enough to worry about without those. Some of you may be unfamiliar with British folklore, so if I had to start anywhere I would start with stones. Stones and circles have always had an intimate relationship. Whether it is a circle made of stones, or a stone with a circular hole in it, it represents power. When I was a child I was fascinated by both. There were stone circles on the land I grew up on. Most of the stones had fallen over the centuries, but the power was still there. I found that out against my will. My name, for the purposes of this story, is Chloe, and I'd like to tell you about my family home. Growing up on a farm can be dangerous for a child, but aside from all the practical ones, I had extra dangers to consider. Our land was old, passed down through generations, and, if my father was to be believed, sat on the crossroads of ley lines. Whether you believe in ley lines or not, it was a powerful place, and there were all kinds of things I had to be careful of. We had rules, and these were added over the years. The main ones were, don't mess around with the stones. Keep away from the footprint. Don't go into the core at the edge of the land alone. If you had to go into the old stable, avoid the third stall, and don't look into it if you hear any noises. And always look at the window. There is so much to tell, I honestly don't know where to start. The farmhouse was old. Ancient, even. It was listed in the Doomsday Book, and whilst a lot of it had been rebuilt or renovated, the core still remained. And being an old house, you would naturally expect it to be haunted. It was, of course. Haunted as hell. But the ghosts, or spirits, were the least of the energy there. The house itself always seemed like some kind of living entity, the wood floors and stone walls having absorbed so much history they could barely contain it. There were births and deaths, fires, murders, curses, blessings, reverence and blasphemy. And make no mistake, although there was Christian imagery throughout the house, it was pagan at its heart. The blasphemy there came from disrespecting the old ways. At some point in its history, an ancestor had tried to placate the Christian god by placing a stained glass window at the foot of the main stairs. But it had backfired terribly. It was intended to be a pastoral scene of a shepherd, probably Jesus, tending to his flock, but the house was stronger than any Christian imagery. Over the centuries it had become part of the lore of the land, and I had learned to look at it, as a kind of divination device, every time I came down the stairs. Some days the main figure was larger than the scenery, his face changing mood by the hour. 
He could look happy or angry or sad or peaceful, depending on the angle of the light and the height of the sun. If it was wet, a raindrop might cling to the opposite side of the window, warping his features or making them utterly blank. The sky behind him could be a mellow yellow, or a rosy pink, or a bloody red, or a grim gray. The sheep in the field could be sheep, or they could be deformed creatures that walked on two legs, or vague shadows of a disconcerting nature, the shape of which could never be defined. I learned to read the window, as if it were a tarot card, and it was very much an instinctual thing. It was a barometer for the mood of the house. But I started off telling you about the stones, so I will concentrate on those for now. They were once standing stones, but over the centuries they fell or sank, although their formation maintained a rough circle. There were many of them, placed by some ancient map, but the ones nearer the house were the ones I paid more notice to. I had grown up with them, after all. One of my earliest memories was watching my father work in the fields. It was a sunny day and he had brought me along whilst he mended a fence, no doubt to give my mother a rest. He had told me to keep away from the stones, of course, but what better way to rouse a child's natural curiosity than to tell them to keep away from something. He was busy, his back turned to me, and I went to investigate the forbidden stones. They were old and weathered, overgrown by moss in places, but where the white stone was exposed was smoothed by the wind and warmed by the sun. They were arranged in a ragged circle, some of them upright, most of them fallen, and I climbed onto one of the fallen ones. I don't remember feeling like there was anything wrong about sitting on the stone. It gave off no vibrations or anything of the kind, and to me it was simply a nice place to sit on a sunny day. I grew bored, however, just sitting, and started to poke at a patch of moss next to me. It was easy enough to pry off with my fingers and I spent a diverting few minutes peeling it away. As I worked, I noticed there was something beneath the dirt that remained after the moss was gone, some sort of carving, and this increased my interest. I brushed the dirt away with my equally grubby hand and saw a symbol. It looked familiar to me, although I couldn't remember where I'd seen it. Completely enthralled now, I started to trace the odd design with a finger, only for a shadow to fall across me. My father's hand appeared, big and rough, and snatched my own hand away. I remember the moment with perfect clarity, the drone of insects, the singing of birds carrying on as if it were a normal day, the sinking feeling a child gets when they know they have been caught doing something they shouldn't have. I looked up into his face. The sun was reflecting off his glasses, creating two blazing panels of a light where his eyes should be, and for a moment he seemed like something other, not a man at all. Did you trace all of it, Chloe, he demanded. I didn't answer. I couldn't tell if he was angry or afraid and I don't know which possibility scared me more. He picked me up under my arms and lifted me from the stone, setting me on my feet and bending down to look me in the face. Without the sun in his eyes, I could see him properly. He looked human again, my father again. He'd had more hair then, and his sweaty fringe hung over his forehead. He looked hot and tired and worried, and my heart sank even further. Answer me, love. Did you trace all of the funny pictures? He was trying to smile but his mouth twitched at the corners, and when I shook my head no he sagged in relief. Told you to keep away from those stones, he chided me, but it wasn't a proper scolding. He was too relieved. And seeing that false smile transform into a real one was the reason I never told him the truth, that, honestly, I didn't know if I had completed tracing the design or not. His work done, he carried me back to the house, bouncing me on his arm and singing a silly song, and I was happy for a moment. Just for that moment. Because everything was perfect then. Right up until my mother met us at the door, her face grim, a blood-soaked towel held in her hands. Nobody ever blamed me for the dog being hit by the car, but I blamed myself. In my child's mind, I made a connection between the thing I had done that had scared my father so much and the death of poor Rowan in the driveway. I felt like it was my fault. Now that I am older, of course, I don't feel that. I know it was my fault. 
The stones were something I was warned about from the moment I was able to understand what I was being told, but there were other things I was cautioned about too. The withered patch of land in the old paddock was another area of concern. The stones had never given me any bad vibes before the day I caused our dog to die by my actions, but the withered patch was a different story. I didn't need to be told to keep away from that. It was an area of land in a round circle about ten feet across. Grass grew there, but it was straggly and had a singed look to it that was somehow different from the old burn scars around the barn. Like the fire had come from deep down under it rather than on the surface. Officially, the older people had always called it the Devil's Footprint, and although my father had always scoffed at the name it was a handy moniker to refer to it by. The story was that the land had been cursed when Lucifer fell, he had been battling God and one hoof touched the earth as he tried to push himself back up to heaven. Bollocks, my father said, often. That mark is older than any bloody Christian ideology. And everyone knows the devil is meant to have a cloven hoof. I agreed. I was a farm child. I knew what print a cloven hoof made and it didn't look anything like that patch of land. But whether it was to do with Satan or not, the footprint scared me and fascinated me in equal measure. Like my father, I had no belief that the devil had made it, but the very idea that something might have a foot that large and walk the earth took hold of my imagination. I dreamed about it, once. I dreamed I was standing by the fence, looking at the footprint as I sometimes did, feeling the strange prickling on my skin it always gave me when I got close enough. The air was still, no birds, no insects. No sound of cars from the road, no planes flying overhead. And beneath my feet, the ground began to shake. Small tremors at first, getting stronger and harder in a rhythmic pulse, and I kept looking at the footprint because I knew something was coming and I did not want to see it. I knew the sight of it might make me insane. Trees broke, the crackling they made as they snapped insignificant against the monstrous thuds of whatever was coming. The sun went dim as the thing blotted it out, turning day into night, and in the shadow it cast I could see my breath misting in the air. I closed my eyes. It was no good merely looking away, the thing was colossal, taking up most of the landscape and I would not avoid seeing it. I saw it in my mind though, a vision it had selfishly put in there. Something huge and ancient that I couldn't quite comprehend, walking upright, antlers scraping the sky. It smelled like freshly dug earth, and tree sap, and a thick musk that was more animal than human, more monstrous than animal. I felt it bend down to look at me, the rush of air as it was displaced by the massive bulk nearly pushing me off my feet, but I was stubborn. I stayed standing, my eyes remained closed. Its breath gusted out, so hot it seared the skin that had been so chilled moments ago, and although I could close my eyes I couldn't close my ears. If it spoke I knew it would deafen me, burst my eardrums, scramble my brain. I woke up before it spoke, still in the grip of my nightmare. At some point during the dream I had wet the bed, recently, judging by how hot it was on my legs, and I was too overcome to let out the scream that was trapped in my throat. In my waking confusion I understood that I had encountered some entity that no human being ever should meet and I was glad I had kept my eyes closed. There are more stories I can tell you about the footprint, or the stones, or the house, if you wish. About Uncle Pete, and his disappearance. His reappearance too. It is all tied into the land. And the stories are endless.